So good afternoon. Welcome to another edition of the Amplify series in the a program that is done, an interview series that is done as part of the CQI Deming Special Interest Group interview series. Today, we are discussing the issue of stimulating learning and innovation for system transformation with Dr. Tim Higgins. I'm just very fortunate. As you all know, this is a series where we unpack the teachings and philosophy of Dr. W. Edward Deming. So good afternoon, Tim. Good afternoon. There is a lot to unpack with Dr. Deming, that's for sure. And that is that is indeed true. These um, interviews have been going on for the past year. It just seems like the more we unpack, the more we have to learn <laughs> with each one. So today, Tim, we have brought you on to help us to unpack this whole question of stimulating learning and innovations for system transformation. Again, it's directly linked and related to, of course, the system of profound knowledge. Before we begin, I would like you to share a little bit about who is Tim Higgins and how you have been become synonymous with the whole question of learning, innovation, and taking this Deming lens to learning and innovation. I started out as a school teacher teaching math and English and discovered that system wasn't very good for what it was doing. Um, I knew things were wrong and I complained about them and offered some suggestions, but I didn't really understand exactly what was wrong. I eventually decided I couldn't, couldn't stay there. It was driving me crazy. So I got a job in industry at uh, Atomics International and I worked there as a specification engineer and found that industry is just as as many issues as the school system had <laughs> uh, and in some ways treats its workers worse than the school treats the children so i i wasn't happy about that but i i didn't know what to do i could complain to management over and over again but they they really they only under, understood what they knew and what they were used to and then sometime in uh mid 80s, I got introduced to Dr. Deming's work. And uh, I worked with Bill Bellows and some other folks, and started to learn uh, a system of profound knowledge in the 14 points. And what I discovered was, Dr. Deming was able to allow me to see what was wrong, but more importantly, to offer things that might help make it better. So I could become less of a complainer and more of somebody who could help them go forward. And Bill and I and others formed a not-for-profit company. And from about 2001 through 2015, we ran yearly conferences in something called the In2N -in Thinking Network. In thinking is thinking about your own thinking and how your thinking determines your behavior. And so if you examine your thinking periodically, you might be able to recognize different ways to behave, the way you're behaving and what effect it's having. So uh, we, we, we had a lot of people as guests who spoke. Russ Acoff is, was one of the contributors frequently. And the great thing about the conferences was the people that came on as speakers stayed at the conference so people could talk to them the other two days. So it was a three-day conference. And here at Rocketdyne, when I moved, it was a sister division to Atomics International where I started. Rocketdyne was building rocket engines and we started doing work here that would implement some of Deming's ideas related to manufacturing parts on the floor and making sure on the shop floor things were going well and the parts were fitting together well and that sort of thing. And we made a lot of progress uh, and, and transformations, but they, they ended up being individual transformations. So we have some departments and some people who can act and implement the new way of doing things, the new philosophy, Deming calls it. But the overall organization, while we had some support from one or two executives, 
the overall organization, we were never able to transform. We still have, I'm now working for NASA at the Rocketdyne facility, so I'm an overseer, and I don't have any more influence on them than I did when I was an employee, even though I'm a customer. <laughs> but I still recognize, and, and, and that's the challenge, wherever you are, you can take a system of pro profound knowledge and apply it and learn something and learn how to make the area you're looking at and working in, you can transform that area. Russ Acoff used to tell, he, he would come here sometimes and he'd talk to the new hires and he said, if you want to change this organization, you're in the best position to do it because you have nothing to lose. If you push really hard and they decide they don't want you, you have time to go somewhere else and, and make a living. But a lot of the people that are here are stuck. So he offered them that the challenge was going to be to figure out what to do. And they would ask, well, you know, I'm a nobody. I, I don't have any status here. I've only been here six months. What can I do? And he says, start from where you are. Find something that you do for somebody else and figure out working in tandem how to make that better so things turn out better and then expand from there. If you find something that works, find somebody and say, hey, I found this works. You think we could do it elsewhere. And so you sort of expand from where you are to something bigger. And what's interesting is you can get a lot done and accomplish a lot, even if you haven't transformed the organization. In order to transform the organization, you have to get, in, in essence, invited in. Dr. Deming used to say, new knowledge comes from outside and by invitation. So if you don't have any executives who are open to receiving and acting on new information, you're going to have a lot of trouble doing transforming. And, and and people, I, I know people that work with Dr. Deming and they would complain about the fact that they couldn't always get executives on board and they're working very hard and they're making progress, but they can't get some, some of the essential executives on board. And Dr. Deming very, very darkly said, sometimes you just have to wait for people to die. And his idea was you transform the people in the organization you can transform and some of them are going to work their way into positions of authority in the organization, and they can help spread the transformation at that level. Uh, Russ Acoff used to tell us, as, as a, as a non-executive, going to the executives and making a presentation is a losing proposition. You're not one of them. They're not going to be influenced by whatever you say. The best you can hope for is they'll treat you nicely and say thank you and that's the last anything will happen. He said, what you have to do is get, you have to teach people above you, find a happy face above you and transform that happy face. It might be your manager, it might be somebody else's manager, and then make him as competent about explaining these ideas as you are, so he can find a happy face at his level and go to his management and see if, if there's a way of transforming there and then you work your way up with the organization and it takes a long time um, it doesn't happen in two years it, it could happen in a decade if you can keep making progress but it takes a long time the good news is as i said you don't have to have everybody in the organization transform in order to make huge a huge amount of progress and i've worked with organizations who have made the change and I've also discovered from several people, one of the things that's easier to do is start an organization and implement these ideas from the beginning and continue to emphasize them. And that's a lot easier than taking an organization that's already got five, 10, 20, 30 years of doing things in the prevailing style of management way and turning that around. That's a much more difficult task. But that's the task most of us have because we aren't starting our own companies. Dick Steele at Peaker Services in Detroit, 
Dick, when he first got a, acquainted with Dr. Deming's ideas, decided to transform Peaker Systems, and he did it, and he made it a Deming-like organization, uh, including people on the shop floor, he had about 90 employees, could decide they were going to get into a plan, do, study, act cycle to learn something. And to do that, they needed to test something or, or, or run some sort of test, and it was going to take company money. And he allowed them to spend up to $2,000 in company money without coming to him or anybody else and asking because he had been working long enough with them. So he knew they recognized what their responsibilities were and they could be trusted to spend that money to help them learn on an idea that could have a huge benefit to the organization. And, and Dick eventually got ready to retire, found somebody who worked with Dr. Deming at General Motors, Ian Bradbury, and got Ian to be uh, the president. And Dick uh, moved to the board of directors. But before he left, he asked the employees if they wanted to buy the company. And they said they did. And he said, well, I'll loan you the money. And so over a period of five years, he turned Peaker Services from a company he owned into a an employee owned corporation so they've been working that way for about i think about 10 years now that's a real success story for the ideas and the ability to continue with those ideas even when the one who started them is gone i mean he still interacts with uh, ian and with the others cuz he's on the board but he's not involved in anything in the day to day activities what an interesting story and what an interesting journey, Tim. Uh, yes. you know, I mean, even in that little sharing there, there's so much to unpack um, about the plan, do, study, act cycles, you know, the the learning and so on. But today we're discussing this whole question of learning and innovation. Can you share um, some insights on how Dr. Deming's teachings and its application help people to, to basically learn and improve and innovate. Yes, in yes. Um, what I discovered about Dr. Deming, which is unique as near as I can tell, is that he took things that are normally separate disciplines uh, that could be studied and you could get PhDs in them with a system of profound knowledge. He's got appreciation of a system, which is systems engineering and systems understanding is a thing all by itself. And when you look at the other elements of a system of profound knowledge in combination, that's very different from the way the world had always looked at them separately. And when you look at things that are interrelated separately, you get a different result. And what Dr. Deming has been able to do and a system of profound knowledge helps with that, has helped me and others see things we couldn't see without applying that lens, he calls it. He calls it a lens for transformation of an organization, but it's, it's not just a lens for transformation of an organization, I discovered. I found out that you can look at the world around you and there's a news story. Um, uh, the news story I remember, <laughs> that occurred to me in Fullerton, California, a hospital had uh, a baby go home with the wrong parents. And the upshot was they fired three nurses and they changed their process they were using for identification and assuring that, that the babies went home with the right parents. And I used, I, that, that sounded weird to me because if the employees screwed up, that meant they weren't following what the rules were. But if they followed what the rules were <laughs> and a baby went home with the wrong parents, that's a different thing. But what these people did is they fired the people as if it was their fault, but they changed the system those people were using. And when, you, when, when I applied Dr. Deming's thinking to this, it became clear that they had made a huge mistake if the system is what generated the behavior, which is typical. The system has a huge input on how people are going to do their jobs. And these people followed that, and it ended up being a mistake. 
it's not their fault. It's the system's fault. So they shouldn't have been fired. Yes, they should have changed the organization. The hospital should have changed how they're doing business, which they did. But they also fired the people. That made no sense at all to me. And, and, and using a system of profound knowledge, the, the four elements, the, the psychology, what makes people do what they do, the appreciation for a system, things are interrelated and connected. When you do something in one place, it affects another place. The, the, the understanding variation, there's variation normal and inherent in everything we do. Some variation has external influences from the norm Deming called special cause variation and understanding the distinction is critical to managing people, but it's also critical to understanding what's going on physically in your organization when you're making parts or, or, or offering services like a hospital. You need to understand what kind of variation you have and how it's interacting with the system and, and, and how, how it affects the people that are there. And then Dr. Deming, of course, had uh, the fourth leg, which is which is about learning. It's about understanding. He says we need a we need a method for being able to create new knowledge. So a system of profound knowledge is a theory, which is essential. A theory is essential for creating new knowledge. So the way you create new knowledge is you have an idea, and you plan a way to test your idea. Then you go through the testing, then you go back and look and say, well, how did the, how easy was it to test? How did the testing work out? What did I learn? And then you decide whether or not that theory makes sense or whether it needs to be amended or whether you need to throw it out and start over with something else. And what I discovered about Dr. Deming is he's known for the work he did with statistics and with helping Japan, but it, he's primarily people seem to perceive him as a numbers guy who keeps track of numbers and helps people understand numbers and that helps them with their organizations. But Deming is about learning. The only reason to collect numbers is to learn something. So it starts with figuring out what you're trying to learn so you know what numbers to go collect. And once I figured out everything was about learning, that started to get me to recognize how using a system of profound knowledge and applying it would allow you insight that creates learning and that learning could be used to make the improvements that you're trying to make. I'm reminded, as you mentioned, when you're unpacking stuff, the, the things that you learn. Deming's offering that applying the theory over and over again gets you better at it. You learn more and more about your organization and you have better opportunities to intervene and make things better at the system level. It's not making the pieces individually better. In fact, that could destroy the system. You need to make the interactions among the things better, and that'll make the system better. I'm reminded of Richard Feynman, who was a, a physicist, rather famous physicist, experimental physicist, who said, the experimental physicist faces an ever increasing frontier of ignorance because every time they come up with a theory and test it and learn something, they find out there's a whole bunch of stuff more that they don't know anything about that they have to go through that same process with. And I found the same thing with applying Dr. Deming's system of profound knowledge to the organization or to whatever part of the organization we're working with. As you apply it, you learn things about the organization and you learn things about applying the system of profound knowledge. Both of those things you didn't know you needed to learn before you applied this, the system of profound knowledge in the first place. You didn't even know they were there to worry about. So it, it's it, people talk about using Deming's ideas and you see you're climbing this mountain and you're getting to a plateau or toward the top of the hill and you're feeling really good about it and you get there and there's a real sense of accomplishment because you've made a clearly a, a change that impact at least the area you're working in, if not the greater organization. And, and you're there and you're feeling so comfortable. And then you look up and you see there's another big hill in front of you. 
And that big hill will always be there, no matter how much you learn about your organization, about how it works, about anything else. There's always more to learn. When I was teaching school, I discovered that the system in the schools is based on your learning is not a curve that starts at the bottom and keeps getting stronger and stronger as time goes on and you learn more and more. They had a belief that there was a certain amount of knowledge in a given discipline, like algebra one. And so your learning in the beginning was sort of fast, but it got up to a point where it plateaued and there was no sense in going on because you now know algebra so that's it you got to go somewhere else and what's interesting about that is that's very different from what Feynman was talking about and what Deming are talking about you can continue to learn in, in a school system if you in college if you take a class and you think you've learned something from it and you get a good grade in the class and then later you want to take the class again because you think you can learn more, they won't give you credit for it because you already took that class. What You already know everything there is about that. <laughs> that's, that's a very strange model. It's as if going back and looking and re-examining things is not going to be beneficial. That's a very strange view of the world. And so what we want to do, if we can, is look at a view that says, I'm going to learn something. And from what I've learned, I may be able to make progress at improving. You can't improve something without knowledge. You have to learn. And learning requires an activity where you start with a theory that says, this is what I think is going on, and come up with a plan for executing the theory and testing it and then collecting the information and afterwards examining the information to see what you learn because you might have learned something about how to set up an experiment which is valuable you might have learned something about how not to set up an experiment there are a lot of things you learn that have nothing to do with the the physical thing you're looking at but that learning is important to examine and then you look at the theory that you came up with and said is this theory going to be useful in predicting the future? Can I take action on this with assurances that in, in some kind of assurance that in the future it, it, it will react in a similar way? And somebody once asked uh, um, how you know you have a good theory. And he says, and Dr. Deming talks about if your predictions come true on a routine basis, then you can operate out of that theory. And so it's a good theory. And he says, it's a, it's a good theory and it's, it's, it's good until you come up with a better one. So it's not as if you ever stop, you keep looking and examining your theory and seeing if there's a better one and, and a better one will replace the existing one. And that learning is key to what's going on. Without learning, you can't make an improvement except accidentally. And then since it was accidental, you don't know how to repeat it because you, you don't know what you don't know what happened to make to make get the result you wanted in the first place. The key is learning, and learning starts with theory. Dr. Deming used to say, uh, management, management thinks it's about numbers. So they're always looking for how much it costs, how much do we invest in it? and prove to me you're gonna get a result that's gonna pay back that money. And they think that that's how they should run things. And yet you'll find in those same organizations that they spend money training people in the organization. And the only thing they can point to is the cost. They can't find anywhere anything that proves that that training paid them back in, over time and how long it took to get paid back but they keep training. And he said, they do that because they're operating out of theory. The people who are trained are gonna perform better and help the organization more than people who are not trained. So they operate out of theory, they're not using numbers. And Deming goes even further. He says, the most important figures are unknown and unknowable. 
like the cost of one unhappy customer. You can't possibly measure it. You can't possibly know it. Like the value of training. You can't measure it. So we have to learn to operate out of theory and then test our theories and continue to test them to see if they still make sense or if we need to amend those theories. And that's very different. I discovered using from Dr. Deming that I was watching my, my kid's 31 now, but when he was like 10, he was trying to do skateboard tricks. And I, I watched him and I watched and I recognized with Deming's help that he was doing a plan, do, study, act cycle. And Deming says, that's the way we learn everything. Brendan would, would have this idea for a skateboard trick. And then he'd say, okay, let me see if I can figure out how to do this. And he'd try a few things and see him trying this and trying that. And the really interesting thing about skateboarding seems to be you get feedback when you test the theory of whether you, this trick is going to work because you end up on the ground <laughs> with scarred arms and knees and everything else. And, and, and as you're learning, you, you, you check how it's going. And sometimes you would try something and he'd try it, you know, five, six, eight times. And then his light bulb would go on that that isn't going to work. So he'd abandon the theory and look for a different trick or a different way to do the same trick. And I was looking at that and I say, that's how everybody learns. He didn't know he was doing a plan, do, study, act cycle. He had no idea. It's a normal and natural way. It's how we learn. And being able to codify it like Deming has and being able to execute it using that technique offers us huge opportunities. Um, Deming used to say, it's hard to use numbers to help you because if you're going to start with a theory, because that's the only way to learn, you need a theory and you need to compare the real world to your theory. You have a theory. In fact, he says, if you don't have a theory, you don't even know what numbers to collect in the first place. You can't validate the theory meets the experience because you don't have the data and you don't know what data to collect till you have the theory. You can't have data and say, I wonder what theory I can build around all this information I got. It's starting in the wrong place. It starts with theory. So you come up with an idea and you find a way to test it and you learn from the testing over and over again. And as I said, you can't improve an organization if you don't gain new knowledge. Because if you keep doing the same things, you're not getting anywhere. And if you randomly try to change something and see how it works out without going through it, some kind of structured approach so you can point out how you learned what you learned and you can continue to use that theory or modify it, it's not going to be very effective. You, you'll make some gains, but it's not, a, it's not nearly as effective. Uh, something you said, Tim, is actually pretty interesting and stimulated on another thought around this issue of psychology. Recently, I participated in a meeting and it was, it seemed like persons were now coming to the revelation that psychology is important. But here the anger that they were looking to study the psychology. One, one of the suggestions was that, oh, we need to learn more about psychology because we need to know why the persons are not following all of the rules and the regulations <laughs> and how that becomes important. And I felt it was interesting, you know, in the context of what you just said. So I wanted to hear what are your thoughts, you know, in relation to this um, new revelation that the human side of quality is also important while, you know, we in the Deming community have long recognized this and, you know, just share your thoughts in, in relation to, the, to that. Yes, I, fi I, I find it interesting that in the school system that they, they they operated under the idea that kids don't want to learn and they have to be made to learn and forced to learn <laughs> and i'm watching brendan doing 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 his tricks if i had gone out there and told him listen you gotta do you, you gotta pay attention to me to learn those tricks he would have abandoned skateboarding altogether people have a normal tendency to learn. You can't stop them from learning. Look at an infant. They learn from the day they're born. You can't stop them from learning. What you can't control always is what they're gonna learn. 
And in fact, often in school, they learn how to get around all the rules and regulations as opposed to paying any attention to whatever subject area you're trying to get through to them. Starting to recognize that the psychology, what goes on in people's heads is important, is gonna be valuable. I haven't seen a lot of evidence yet that, there, that there's recognition that when you're working with people, it's not about controlling what they're gonna do. School systems are about conformance, making sure everybody does the same thing. You get in line, you don't talk without raising your hand. It's got all those rules and regulations. It's about conformance. It's not about learning. Learning is a whole different activity. And, and the feeling is without all that restriction and control and forcing people to do things, there won't be learning. So they're very nervous and attempting to understand psychology so that they can more easily manipulate the people they're responsible for. That's a way different use of psychology. What Dr. Deming's talking about is understanding why people do what they do and then appe appealing to using that understanding to help you. That's a whole different thing. It's way different. It's leading as opposed to driving. You've heard people talk about, they wanna drive change, change through the organization. Say so driving isn't gonna work. That's like standing behind the cows and whipping them to get them to go where you want them to go. That defies the psychology of people. People want to do something, they wanna learn and they wanna do something that's gonna be beneficial to themselves and to others. They want to contribute. It's one of the, biggest motivators that people have. It's not about the money. It's not about the trophy. It's about doing the best they can and being recognized that they're part of something bigger than themselves. And so what Dr. Deming tries to do is help us grasp that a whole bunch of what we do, he calls it destructive forces. It hammers the individual. It's the forces of destruction pushing down on the normal innate ability of humans to be happy and to learn and to go about their business. They like to work. The, the view has been since the industrial revolution, people don't like to work. You have to force them to work. And, and what Russ Acoff pointed out is before the industrial revolution, work and play were done at the same time it was all you were playing and you were working and you were learning all of that was happening in one thing when the industrial revolution hit we seem to separate things because we got more mechanical so there's a place where you learn but you don't have any fun and, and you don't work and there's a place where you play where you don't work and you don't learn and there's a place where <laughs> where where you work and don't learn and don't play it's crazy. People do all three of those things all the time. And you have to recognize that. And if, if you want to be effective at leading them, leading them is, is influencing and helping them see things that you see that would be helpful, not figuring out what you can do to manipulate their behaviors. The only behavior I used to, I taught a class here years ago when they were looking at things and we, we, we were talking about behavior because people were doing what they thought was the right thing, but it, was, it, it wasn't really the right thing to do. It didn't follow the rules and sometimes it was screwing things up. And so part of the class was I was trying to introduce them to behavior and how people work. I said, if a guy puts a gun to my head or a gal and says, give me all your money, do I have to give him the money? And the answer is no. And everybody recognizes that. I could do something else, although I might get hurt. <laughs> I, can, I have options. And what I tried to help people grasp, and most people do, the only behavior I can hope to control is my own. Because if I go up to you, uh, Chris, and put a gun to your head and say, give me your money, you might not like the options, but you've got, if you have a gun on you, you could pull it and use it. You could slap my hand. You could run like crazy. You could grab somebody walking by and use them as a shield. I cannot control, even with a gun in my hand, your behavior. 
I'm trying to influence it, that's for sure, but I can't control it. So as soon as you recognize that you cannot control anybody else's behavior, whether it's a kid, a student, a, a worker, a coworker, a boss, a wife, a husband, it doesn't matter. You work on your own behavior and you look at the results because part of what happens when you interact pe with people, the result you get has to do with how you're treating that person. If you, if, you, if you treat a person as if he's a thief and a crook, he's more likely to behave as a thief and a crook than if you treat him as if he's trustworthy. It's, it's, it's part of the psychology. And once you recognize people want to learn, your opportunity is to find out what things most interest, they're most interested in and help them the, as best you can learn those things or find somebody who can help them learn those things. That's a whole different kind of activity. There's a great school in Sudbury, Massachusetts, um, um, and they have no curriculum. And kids from about six years old through whenever they decide to leave, several of them as early as 16 or 18, all the way through high school, they go every day and they can do whatever they want. And there are people there to help them learn whatever they want to learn. But they, 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 they quickly realize, with the help of the people that are there, that learning is their responsibility, not the responsibility of the school and the staff. The staff is there to help them, but they're responsible. And by gosh, those kids are amazing. You, I saw a composition written by a 13-year-old who explaining he'd heard that you know, when he was younger and he, he sort of knew what it meant, but he, he was just saying it like a mantra. And then, then it occurred to him at 13, well, I get it now. If I think I want to learn about something, I need to go find somebody who can help me or, or can either help me directly or send me to somebody who can help me so I can learn the things I want and need to learn. And it's not about anybody else doing that. It's about me. And I thought, this is amazing because I was managing in the organization at the time. And, and I was surprised to find out that a 13-year-old had recognized that. And I had 40-year-olds that had, hadn't figured that out yet. <laughs> they thought everything relied on everybody else. So we trapped the individual into thinking he can't do anything unless somebody's forcing him to do it. We trapped the ones who are supposed to be helping the learners into thinking that they have to demand things and force things to make them happen. That's, that, that's not effective. And understanding how people work is so valuable, especially when you understand that they like working together and sharing. If people have a common purpose and agree to a common method of achieving that purpose, you don't need to do anything else. They are going to be motivated to make that happen. So your job as a leader is to help them see the common purpose and include them in under, helping understand how what they do affects that common purpose. And then you sort of stay out of the way and help them manage the interactions they have in order to achieve that purpose. It generates cooperation if you have the same objective, the same purpose, and the same means of achieving it. The I want to stick up in there. I want to stick up in there, Tim. I want to stick up in there, Tim. Just to just to throw in another question. What about the assumption that following the rules is actually going to bring about quality, and like following the rules is the be all and end all that is necessary to create quality, and the assumption that the rules are necessarily fit for purpose. As you mentioned, yeah. purpose just now. Because I know the other day also related a, a pretty interesting story in terms of how you approach your audits. You know, if you could also share that story also. Yeah, that that's a, a, certainly you want compliance, as, you know, especially with safety and a whole bunch of other things. And there's there's nothing terrible about compliance. It's valuable. You have to recognize what where compliance is necessary and you have to set up standards and 
uh, ways to evaluate them. There's nothing wrong with that. The difficulty that we run into uh, frequently is we have a belief that somehow in an organization, even if you only had a 10 person organization, but if you've got an organization like this place, that's 2,500 people, if you think you can write the rules for everybody and all the different work they do on a day-by-day -day basis, carefully enough that everybody would have a set of rules that would guarantee a great outcome in the, in, in the long term, you're sadly mistaken. The executives, you're absolutely right, believe that when something goes wrong, it's because somebody in the organization didn't follow some of the rules. They have not yet figured out that the organization, the system, this is, a, this is a, a, an interesting thing. The system is perfectly capable of ge generating the results it gets. So when you see a result you don't like, you have to ask the question, what in the system generated that result? The system is perfectly designed to get that result. It got the result. So a belief that you can design a system and set up rules that are perfect enough never to have anything go wrong, that, that's, that's, that's like dreaming and believing in unicorns. There's, there aren't unicorns, and there, there is no such thing as developing a system like that. So yes, you're going to have guidelines. Yes, you're going to, and you're going to have discussion discussions around establishing and as you pointed out when you do audits which i do now because i'm a customer with nasa so i'm looking at rocket i is building rockets for us and and their way they're building the parts and the way they're managing the flow of work and all that and so there are rules and regulations we impose on them contractual obligations and 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 specifications and other things when i do an audit what i do is I get the, the list of things they're supposed to do, the compliance document, whatever that is. And then before I do any auditing, I go through each of the requirements and I ask myself, what is the purpose of that requirement? There must be a purpose. If you have a requirement and there's no purpose, get rid of the requirement, there's no purpose. So every one of them has a purpose and I write down the purpose next to it. And I go down however big my checklist is, and I write the purpose for each one of those. Now, when I have the purpose, when I go to do my audit, I have the requirement that's stated in black and white says, this is what you need to do. Then I have a purpose that I coordinate with some others, so I'm not the only one developing the purpose. What's the purpose of this requirement so I understand it? And then... I watch what gets done, and then I document what happens. And one of the columns is for documenting. They did exactly what the black and white words say. And I check that box. The question, next question is, and the next column is, did it achieve the purpose they wanted? And that might be yes, and it might be no, because they could have done exactly what the black and white words were, but didn't get where they wanted to go. The third column says, did they use a different, did they achieve the purpose, but use a different method than the words that are written down? And that can be yes. So what that allows me to do when I get done is check to see if they're achieving the purpose because the, the purpose is getting done. I'm happy because that's the point. Now, then I'm, a, I'm, I'm allowed to check and say, well, did some of this happen because they were doing something different from the rules and regulations? If so, then we ought to fix the rules and regulations. So as a result, I'm learning more, they are learning more. And, and as I said, no matter what you do, you're never gonna write down rules that are good enough, that, that no mistakes are gonna get made. And just because everybody's following the rules doesn't mean there are going to be no mistakes. There are always going to be mistakes. And there are going to be things you didn't even realize would happen. They're going to occur and you're going to have to deal with them. But the idea is compliance. Yes, we want to value compliance. Phenomenon happens once we write down a requirement and impose it either on a company or on a person. 
we forget why we wrote that down as something to do and start looking at whether they're doing what we wrote down. So the purpose now is lost. In, in fact, there, there are a whole bunch of regulations and rules that I'm supposed to be enforcing that we can't figure out a real purpose for them. And so when that happens, I try to get the organization, my organization, NASA, I said, we need to change that rule or eliminate it entirely because because it's it's not it's not achieving any purpose. There's no reason for it. We need to get rid of it. So that's that's some of what goes on with compliance and and recognizing that yes, things are going to go wrong. And executives, I used to I used to I I'd go to executives meeting because I was on the staff of a vice president of quality, and so I'd go to all the executive staff meetings. And I'd listen to things and I'd make comments because I'm not good at keeping quiet when people that are supposed to know better and getting paid a lot of money don't do as well as they should. So I, 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 I would often comment and I'd offered him that, that some of the difficulty we were in is asking people to do things that are counterintuitive, that, are, that, are, that, that don't seem to make sense. And when you don't explain to them why you want them to do that, it's very hard to, to expect them to behave in the way you're thinking they should because it just doesn't make sense to them. Uh, there's a, 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 common, a common thing that they call when you're studying causes of, of accidents and you look at something, there's a, there's, a, there's a thing called stereotyping. Stereotyping can be a good thing, it can help you by designing your system. Like, for example, a, a huge stereotype is when a switch is up, it's the thing that it's tied to is on. When a switch is down, the thing that's tied to is off. That's a, that's a very strong paradigm, if you will, or mental model. So you can create a system where in some cases, up means it's off and down means it's on, and it will work a lot of the time but it will fail a percentage of the time because it's against the, the normal flow of things. And because it's against the normal, people make errors. I, 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 I try to sail a 16 foot catamaran, a Hobie cat. And, and if I don't sail you know, a couple of times a month just to keep, keep my skills up, if I lay off for six months and go out, it's really intriguing. I've got a tiller in my hand and I'm headed and I got a lot of wind in the sail. So the boat is starting to tip and I, and I want to turn the tiller to take some of the wind out of the sail, especially in emergency when it's a gust of wind. I sometimes push the, or pull the, the tiller in the wrong direction. And it's interesting because the stereotype is when you're driving something, if you turn to the right, or you move to the right, that thing you're driving goes that way. When you're operating the tiller of a boat, when you push the tiller to the right, the rudder goes to the left and the boat goes to the left. <laughs> and so as a result, sometimes when this big gust of wind comes up and I'm sort of surprised by it and I haven't been sailing in a while, I push the tiller in the wrong direction. I get more wind in the sail and we're now on our side with the sail in the water having to right the boat. So stereotyping is one of the kinds of things that happens in systems that creates that. And so what I used to do with the executives, I say, hey guys, you tell me whenever you, some, something goes wrong, that the system is broken. And I said, I'd like to challenge that. Your system is not broken. It's perfectly designed to get that result you don't like. Your system generated, it got that result. That's your system. No, it's broken. No, this is your system. It's not broken. I, I used to tell them, part of your difficulty is you think your system is broken because it's not behaving like a Formula One racer. So a racing car and a Formula One racing car, it's not behaving like that. I said, because your system is a perfectly designed Mercury Villager. 
it's not going to get the performance of, of that super sports car. So it's not broken. It's just a different, you need a different system if you want a different result. It's not a broken system. It's a perfectly functioning system. So now, instead of worrying about the broken thing, ignore the brake. How can you do things better that would prevent that kind of thing from happening again? That's a system change. It's much more effective and much more useful. It requires theory. It requires collecting data. It requires study. And frankly, I don't think they want to spend the energy. They'd rather say the system's broken, go fix it. And that's okay. It's simple. It's just not effective. You know, that's pretty interesting, Tim, because you have covered like a lot of ground in this short space of time. One of the things that we'll also like to probably have a, a part of the conversation cover for many, you know, they're hearing a lot of these things probably for the first time, probably reinforcing a lot of their past learning and so on. But they still may be lost as to how. How do we really go about building this sort of culture of... Yes innovation and continual improvement and transformation and applying these demand principles, you know, applying the system of profound knowledge, you know, if you could unpack some of that system of profound knowledge and how do we really go about not only building the individuals, building the system and possibly even building the interactions that are needed to support, you know, sustaining such a momentum. Yeah, that that's key. It's the interactions where we, we are taught that Russ Acuff used to talk about different kinds of systems. There are mechanical systems. There are single-minded systems. There are social systems and there are ecological systems. And we, we are somewhere trapped with organizations between sort of thinking they're, uh, they're either mechanical systems or thinking they're single-minded systems like a body. Uh, and the common, most common one now is it, we see the organization as a single-minded system, like the body where the parts don't have any choice. They just do what the brain tells them to do. And the executive are the brains and everybody else are the parts. And if those parts would just do what the brain's telling them to do, the executives think everything would be okay. Not so much because that's a single-minded system. What you have is a social system which Russ points out is multi-minded. Russ said, in a single-minded system, Chris, you can drive your Pontiac into the wall at 40 miles an hour. That's a single-minded system, you dominating the car, doing what you want. However, if you're riding a horse and you elect to ride it into the wall at 10 miles an hour, the horse has something to say about it. That's a multi-minded system. Russ said, if your car breaks down, what you need to do is treat it as a mechanical system because it is a mechanical system. But when your organization breaks down, it's a mistake to treat it like a mechanical system. It's not a mechanical system. It's not a single-minded system. It's a social system. And you need to treat it as a social system. Applying these things, uh, profound knowledge is, is and, and you, you apply it in a small space in a small way just to learn how to apply it and learn one of the key features Deming talks about it being a system one of the key features of a system is interdependency so in this case there are four elements and they're interdependent which is way different from dependent interdependent means what's going on in one place depends on what's going on in the other three and what's what's going on in the other three depends on what's going on in that one place it's it, it, and if you pull any one of those things out of the system, the system fails to be the system anymore. It's something different. And so you need all four and you need to recognize they're going to interact. So one of the things you can do, Deming calls it appreciation for a system, is recognize there will be interdependency. So if you're looking at a, a problem area, maybe to say, maybe I can use profound knowledge to help, you have to decide how much of the area you're gonna look at. When we talk about a system, every system is actually a subsystem. It's, there's something else that it's part of. 
So what you do is you say, well, what am I going to focus on? And let's draw the boundary around that system. And the great thing about drawing boundaries around systems is those boundaries don't exist. And you have to remember that that's a that boundary. There's other things happening outside the boundary that affect the system. But you want to focus on that, recognizing that that's an area you might have some level of control over so you can do some exercises to learn something with or do something. And the good news is, since that's a boundary that you invented and is in your head, if you don't like that boundary, you can change it and make it more narrow to focus, or you can make it bigger to take in bigger things. Deming points out, the larger you draw the boundary, the more complicated the system and the more difficult it is to, to, to have an effect on the changes, but the more powerful the change is. So bigger is better in a lot of senses, but it's got some downside to it. So focus on something small, something you do every day, perhaps, and something you think, well, maybe I could do it better. One of the things when you say do it better is when you're done with your work, who uses it? Who do you hand it off to? And go talk to who you hand it off to and say, hey, I do this for you. Uh, is, there, is there something I could do that might help you? Uh, what do you do with it? The most important question is, what do you do with the work I give you? Because if you go to somebody, if I go to you, Chris, and say, what do you do with my work? You're going to say, well, I know what Tim is, and I know what he works on. So I'm thinking about his area. He can't do anything for me. Now, when I bring you the work, I bring you a, 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 a staple five sheet piece of uh, printout that, that's stapled together that has what you want. When I go over and ask what I can do, you say, no, this is great. You're doing a great, I'm getting my stuff. It's on time. It's got the staple or it's on time. And I, and I'm doing, I said, but what do you do with it? And I watch you and you say, well, watch, you take the staple out, you go to a three hole punch, you put three, three holes in the, in the papers. Then you open a, a notebook, a three hole notebook, and you put the papers in the three hole notebook and close it back up. And then I say, I can do that for you. Do you want me to do that? Oh, I didn't know you could do that. Yeah, I can. So you have just learned by interacting with who uses your work, how you could help it, how it would help them. How about the way I lay out the columns? How about the data I put in there? Whatever it is that you think you can offer him uh, or her that you're talking with. And so that helps you when you go back to your area and say, okay, now I want to apply a system of profound knowledge. How big do I want to draw the system? Just this one person, this one customer, or do I want it bigger? Maybe it's just the customer and who you get the data from or who you get whatever stuff you need to create your work from. So that's your system. You say, okay, what kind of variation can I expect? Is, is there a lot of hiccups in this and, and a lot of, uh, or is, are things more stable. So now you're looking at variation and understanding whether you've got a, a system that gives you predictable behavior or whether the system is unpredictable and, and jumping around. And if it's unpredictable, in order to make it better, you have to figure out how to get rid of all the things that are making it bounce around. And so that brings in common cause variation, normal and natural, and special cause variation and understanding which is which so that you can work on the stabilization and therefore improve that, that process that's giving you those weird results. So now we've, we've, we've taken the system and said, okay, I sort of know what the system is. I I've, I've, I've kind of understand the amount of variation. Now, if I want something to happen, what's the psychology behind this? What is going to help the interactions between me and whoever I have to get the data from and between me and who I'm giving the data to that would help those interactions, those personal interactions, develop ways. One of the things that happens is we have to start learning to ask better questions because typically our questions end up when we're trying to gather information, 
we should be asking open-ended questions. An open-ended question doesn't have a yes or no or a single word answer because you're trying to gather information. But we frequently ask questions like, do you want me to do it this way? That's a yes or no answer. You don't learn much from that. And so learning to ask open-ended questions so you can gather information. What you do with a closed-ended question is confirm the information. <laughs> so, okay, I think I heard you say, this is what you like. Is that right? Now you got a closed-ended question confirming the answer you got to the open-ended question. That allows you much more insight into how you're interacting with people. And another thing to remember is you're not going to be able to control the behavior of the other guy. He might seem like a, a, a very nasty and, and hard to get along with and petulant kind of a guy. And maybe he is, maybe he isn't, but that's how he seems. If you approach him if that, as if that's the kind of guy you're approaching, you're going to get a different result than if you approach him as if he's a guy that wants to understand, wants to learn. He may not be, but you can get him there eventually by asking questions in a way that doesn't challenge him and doesn't force him into any corners or areas he probably doesn't want to be. So, for example, going up to him and say, why can't you get me this data earlier instead of on Friday? That's a bad, psychologically, that's a terrible question. He's already on the defensive. You say, hey, what can we do that would make it easier for me to get the data around this time? Because that's really helpful to me. And he may not have any ideas. You may have some suggestions. Either way, the question is a different question that solicits different results. The other thing is be very appreciative when somebody responds to you. When somebody gives you feedback, the least you can do is say thank you. <laughs> Even if the feedback is, you're an idiot, get out of here. Well, <laughs> thank you for the feedback, I'll get out of here. But the idea is what you want to do is create a relationship. And even if it's not a friendship, it's a relationship. It can be a business relationship. That's fine. So you're not going to go out and, and invite that guy over to dinner. You're not going to go out to pub with him. That's fine. But what you're doing is establishing a working relationship. You are going to ask intelligent questions. You're, you're, you're going you're gonna to try to be understanding of his how he sees the world. When there's conflict between people, what you commonly find is they have different views of the world, different views of the facts. And as long as you have different views of the world, different views of the facts, it's going to be hard to get cooperation. So part of what you're trying to do is by asking the questions and seeing the responses, which kinds of questions get better responses and how to build up that relationship. So part of it is building relationships and building relationships is hugely important. And psychology, since people like to feel part of something bigger than themselves, walking over to somebody who, who offers you the data you need in order to put your report together that you pass along to somebody else. What's fascinating here, we have a very, at the, the, since they build rocket engines, we have a very visible means of telling how well we did because when the rocket goes off, if we didn't do well, it'll blow up. So it's kind of spectacular. But every time it goes off and everything goes well, what's really useful is helping people feel connected. And the way I can do that is one guy getting my data from, from you, Chris, for example, I can go to you and say, hey, Chris, last week when you gave me that report, I wanted to thank you for that. And I wanted to tell you, how much I appreciate what you're doing because what you're doing when you give me that data in a timely fashion is I do this with it and I take it over here and they do that with it and it goes over here. And then because of what goes on over here, there are decisions made about whether we should launch or whether we should wait or whether we should change something before we launch. That's hugely important. So the reason that rocket went off is because you did what you did and a lot of people did what they could do. Thank you for contributing. That feeling that you generate, 
people want to contribute and they want to make a difference. They don't just want to contribute without knowing why what they do makes any difference. They want to feel like what they did has made a difference. And it can be a small difference or a big difference, but thanking them for helping make a difference is hugely valuable. Executives used to want to hand out every once in a while, you know, $500 award to somebody who did something they thought was brilliant and all that stuff. And I, and I used to offer them that you would get way more out of going out every day and thanking people that you see for doing what they do and contributing to the organization than you'll ever get out of handing out $500 awards. <laughs> Just go out every day and thank people, not for doing anything special, for doing what they always do. Thank you. Thank you for being part of this system and making it better. But Tim, consider consider this, that we have this MVP culture. We, we understand do. where we, we place like this one person as the best employee of the year or the most valuable contributor in the yep. system. Is this a systemic thing? Is it not? Yes. Why Why do yes. we continue to do it? And a, um, if we are applying a Deming lens, is that something we cut out? I, or what are some suggestions yeah. around, you know, cutting yeah, something doc, like that Dr. Oh. Deming, Dr. Deming calls all those rewards and recognition uh, among the forces of destruction. And, and it's because... As Deming sees it, and so do a lot of other people, like Alfie Cohn is one of my favorite authors who, who wrote Punished by Rewards and The Schools Our Children Deserve. Really good stuff. I like his work. And he's got a lot of documentation. But what, what you're talking about is very real and very active. And in fact, when people don't hand out most valuable awards, they feel like they're not doing what they're supposed to. And unfortunately, we've trained either the kids that report to them or the or in the workforce, the adults that report to them. But yeah, if somebody's not handing out rewards, there's something wrong. What's difficult about overcoming that is, as you said, it's very, very strong. I had a couple of ways myself doing something I could do. What happened here when I was a Rocketdyne person instead of a NASA person, uh, at the after a launch, sometimes NASA would send out a bunch of trinkets, you know, little pens or, or decals or stuff and, and t-shirts sometimes. And then what would happen is the organization, although there are a lot of programs going on here and about a third of the workforce worked on the NASA space shuttle main engine program, the NASA customer would send rewards and they would hand, and, and the company would hand them out to the people who worked on the S space shuttle main engine program and say, yeah, here are your rewards. They didn't recognize that while that was, might be some kind of motivation for those people, all the people that worked on the other programs, if they weren't working on those other programs, Rocketdyne would not be making enough money to let <laughs> the people working on the SSME engine to work only on the SSME engine. So in essence, they contributed too. So I started doing things just by myself and said, thank you for sending out the t-shirt. Did anybody other than space shuttle main engine program people get it? And the answer was no. And I'd send them a note and I said, you know, it really would be valuable if we could figure out how to spread this out and have everybody participate in the reward. And if the customer's only given us 2,500 uh, T-shirts, what we might do is have a drawing and hand out the, to the 2,500 whose names get picked out of a lottery and thank them for their contributions. Although they weren't specifically to the space shuttle main engine, they helped because it allowed space shuttle main engine to do its work. And then next time the customer gives something, exclude the 2,500 that got the T-shirts and do a draw and hand them out. So there are ways to spread the idea that we're all contributing. And, and they, you know, they thanked me for my contribution, went out about their business. But the next time there were t-shirts, they got enough t-shirts to hand, hand, hand them out to everybody. The customer is happy with handing them out. NASA was okay with that. So they handed them out to everybody. So I sent a note to the executive, same executives I badgered about earlier. And I said, 
thank you for what you did. It's a great, it's a, it's it's a it's great that you're recognizing everybody at this place contributed to that successful wine. Thank you for that. And their response was, <laughs> was we're glad you like the T-shirt. <laughs> so they 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 weren't getting what I was saying clearly. And then. Not too long after that, they, somebody had nominated me for a pillar award, which I think came with five or six hundred dollars or something. I don't know. It came with some money, and the pillar awards were given out once a year. And there was a special thing where they invited not everybody in the company, but only the people that were getting awards and some of their compatriots that worked on the same program. And they had sort of a, a party, but it wasn't a private party. It was under a tent, so everybody on the campus could see that they weren't invited to that party. And then they try to hand out these awards. When they nominated for me the award, award I said, thanks for the nomination. I, I, I really don't feel comfortable accepting an award like this. And I said, well, it, it, you may not get the award. And I said, what does that mean? They said, well, we nominated four of you. So now what we're going to do is have each of the four of you write up who you think of the four of you should get that award and that's who we'll give the award to and I said, well now i know for sure i don't want to be part of this we're 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 singling out four people to single out one person to to, to have a bunch of people gather together and celebrate that one thing i said we need to be way more inclusive so i'm i'm going to thank you again for the nomination but i don't want to have anything to do with it and so they went on about their business. A, a year later, when awards were coming up in the conversation again, the vice president that I worked for came to me and said, how would you feel if we gave you an award? And I looked at him, you know, out of the, because he, he knew how I felt. He, I looked at him and I said, mm, uh, and he said, no, no, no. We think this is a good idea. We think it's valuable. Uh, how would you feel about it? And I said, I wouldn't like it at all, but I promise if you decide to do that, because I know you guys think it's a good idea, I won't embarrass you by telling you how destructive this is to the organization when I accept the award. And so he elected not to put my name forward, which I thank him for. But then I got an award for being, they have a thing called a pilot was helping people learn how to do continuous improvement. And I was working in a certain area, so they divided it up. I think we had probably had 50 pilots and the company was going through this big thing about achieving all their objectives around this continuous improvement stuff. And, and, and the corporate guys would come down and audit us and decide whether we were bronze, silver, or gold based on how well we what we presented and, and whether they thought it met their vision of what was supposed to happen. I was one of the pilots and I helped. And, and the pilot's job in the most part is to tell everybody to collect information and show them the format and to gather the information. It wasn't really to do the work of making a process better. It was to get the information from those who did and then be able to share it in a presentation. And so that at the end of the second year, I think we gathered that information, we presented it to the to the higher ups, and and we got gold status. And so we went back to our desks and about our work. The next thing I know, they 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 send me a note and saying, "Well, as a pilot, you were nominated as you know an outstanding pilot." So you're going to get a check for for I think it was twelve hundred dollars and and you're going to you get some I don't know certificate or something and I said no no don't do that and they said too late it's it's already in the works it's going into your bank account and I said okay so now I'm stuck with this money and I have the feeling that the work I did of gathering that stuff together was a lot less of a contribution than the work that was done by the people who made the processes better, who aren't getting any recognition at all. And I said, this makes no sense. And I didn't know what to do. So I went back and said, okay, I got it. And I 
I, I figured out how many people, I couldn't do the whole company. So I figured out how many people were in that group that I was dealing with. It was about 180 people. And I said, okay, with that money, how can I help those people feel like they contributed to what was going on? And I went out and I bought a copy of, I can't remember one of the books. It could, it could have been the new economics. I, I, it might've been Alfie Cohn's book, Punished by Rewards. I don't know, one or the other. And I got a, a couple of trinkets that go in a basket and I got a bag to carry them. So I got 108, I used $1,200 to get 180 of those bags. And then I went to the staff meetings with, with the managers requested at their staff meetings if I go to the staff meetings and hand out these bags and they said yes and I'd hand out the bags and tell them what the bags were for and all that and so I spent all the money doing that and then advertised to people that that's a better way to do things instead of narrowing the focus of course it doesn't have that huge an impact on the organization after that they put me on the rewards and recognitions committee and, and I looked at my bar I looked at my boss when he did that and he said, no, no, no. I think what you can do is have an influence on them so you know we can change this. And I, so I reluctantly said, yes. I went to the first meeting. It's hard to explain, but, but those people were so eager to hand out, figure out who was gonna get an award and hand them out. And they felt they were doing the right thing. They were almost like a bunch of cheerleaders. They were so excited about this. And to stand up in the middle of that and tell them what they were doing is all wrong, there was no point in that. And, and there was no way I was going to get them to recognize that no matter how much pleasure they felt, they were creating displeasure in a lot of others. The vice president secretary, when I when I went to her in, in into her office one day, she was looking really down. And I said, Barbara, what's the matter? And she says, I hate this time of year. And I said, what time of year? And she says, it's, it's, it's admin of the year time. And I said, oh, what, what? Yeah, okay. What, what do you hate about admin of the year? They, they make all this brouhaha about one person who's the admin of the year and, you know, and sort of ignore the rest of us. And it, it just makes me feel sad. And I said, well, yeah, I, I recognize that, Barbara. When they do that, they don't recognize how destructive it is and how bad they're making you feel. And she said, it hurts anyway. And I just thought, yeah, of course it does. <laughs> that idea, if, if, we, if those cheerleaders who are handing out awards could see how upset Barbara was over that whole thing, and she can't have been the only person that was upset by that, that then maybe they wouldn't feel as, as as satisfied by handing out those things and and the, all i can say is out of all the things that that the deming pushes the psychology part especially the elimination of of rewards recognition individual rewards recognitions and and performance appraisals it is the hardest thing to change and I would offer, if you're trying to change your organization, you might attack that last because it is a huge challenge. Peter Schultes wrote a book called The Leader's Handbook, really good book. And he told us it was meant to be an explanation of why performance appraisals were a bad thing to be doing. But he doesn't talk about performance appraisals till chapter eight out of 10 chapters. So we asked him, Peter, you know, it's about performance appraisals. Why did it take to chapter eight to get there? And he says, because if I didn't write the first seven chapters, they wouldn't understand what I was talking about when I talked about getting rid of the performance appraisals and managing differently. That's how hard it is. You need eight chapters of, of Deming kind of information and understanding before you can get people to easily buy into what he was talking about with the destructive forces of rewards and recognitions and ratings and rankings. So Tim, you know, this, this is just the first part of the series that we are doing. So we're really looking forward to the next portion. But for today's session, 
I don't know if you care to share any key takeaways for today, why we will continue the conversation around the same issues in terms of um, stimulating innovation and learning for system transformation. So if you want to we just summarize some key takeaways from today with our next recording uh, next week, we would um, continue the conversation. I think it's not next week, next two weeks, right? No, two, yeah, two weeks. Right, yeah. so in two weeks' time, we'll continue the conversation on the same area. As you know, this is a really um, difficult, not not difficult topic. Like you said with Alfie, he took eight chapters in order to just get to <laughs> where we want to get to. So I guess we're on the first three chapters. Yeah. And we will begin the next three chapters at the next session. But any key takeaways for today? Yeah, I guess... I guess the key takeaway is kind of like a most valuable player, but but I, I get what you're talking about. <laughs> and the and the the idea is the idea is for me how much Dr. Deming valued learning and knowledge. In fact, he used to say there's no substitute for knowledge. It, th there's no substitute. With, without knowledge, where are you gonna go? And so it's how do you gain knowledge and how do you how do you promote learning and that sort of thing i think that's the key and and he used to say that knowledge is invaluable that that, that that's what you need and claire crawford mason who who worked with dr deming in developing tapes and learning methodologies she kept prodding him and asking him what knowledge are we talking about <laughs> and and deming finally told her profound knowledge. And she said, what's profound knowledge? And that's before he had developed his theory of profound knowledge. She sort of poked him enough that in the early 90s, he started working on that. And profound knowledge at one time had eight elements and then it had six. When he finally wrote um, the new economics in 1993, it had the four he has now. And it probably would have been different now because he died in 90s shortly after so so we don't have how he would have developed his theory but he was all about learning the the importance of learning can't be underestimated you cannot make an improvement except by accident without learning and so if you're going to wait around for accident to get improvements to happen you're going to have a struggle in your organization you need to have a methodology for learning and the plan, do, study, act cycle is one. And you have to be careful with the plan, do, study, act cycle. I'm married to Brazilian and I've been in Brazil a few times and I've worked with some people who are Deming people in Brazil. And in Brazil, it's plan, do, check, act. And it's not about learning. It's about program management. You have a goal. You plan to achieve the goal doing this. You check to see if you met the goal. And you act either by, you know, saying, oh, shucks, we got to change things or confirm that you met the goal. It has nothing to do with learning. And so it's a, it's a, it's what Deming's talking about with learning is we're after coming up with things that you didn't recognize before, or you recognize and weren't convinced were, were useful. And the idea of starting with a theory, collecting the data, comparing the data, the real world to your theory, and then making a judgment about what you learn and how useful your theory is. So you can either adopt the theory and apply it or change it and, and do the run through the experiment again and see what you learn. So it's about learning and anything we can do to learn is valuable. Again, thank you, Tim, for this, the first in the interview series and we look forward to discussing again. I look forward to this too, because I love to hear myself talk. <laughs> well, um, the sad thing is, I, I think I love to hear you actually speak and elongate on these issues. Today was a really profound um, day. It had me actually taking a lot of notes. You saw me actually I decided taking some notes and not only taking some notes, just really reflecting on all that has been said. And a lot of really great insights have been shared. And I really look forward to the um, the continuing conversation as we unpack how do we move into the practical elements of stimulating that innovation, you know, removing the barriers, including persons moving towards the 
common purpose, moving from this single-mindedness that the brain is at the top of the system to developing this collective intelligence and so on. So it's just like so much more to build on as we start to move towards the cooperation that we need, the joint work that we need, and to really unpack this whole system of profound knowledge, uh, which we hope in the next interview we'll get much more into. Today has set a really great foundation for the future conversations. Thank you for that. I'm going to offer something too to everybody listening. Ron Moen offered to me when I went to a Deming uh, four-day seminar, he offered to all of us and he said, when you hear something from Dr. Deming and you think, that's crazy, what's the matter with this old man <laughs> thinking like that? Instead of reacting that way, say, I wonder what he sees that I'm not seeing. And frankly, whenever you bump into anybody who says something that you think is really stupid, you might go back and ask that same question because he sees things differently from you. That's why you're reacting that way. It doesn't mean he's right or wrong. He's just seeing things differently. Thanks, Tim. Looking forward to the next conversation. Thank you.